uh, one of my early uh, was that I wanted a one cut that I didn't have to do multi-cut on because the other thing is as soon as you cut your productivity goes to zero until it can form leaves again. So you're losing a chunk of the center part of the best part of the growing season whereas if we can keep growing it then we don't have that. And what we've been doing is looking at using homolactic bacteria and ensiling a lot wetter stuff and one of the things we're going to be looking at this year is taking the length of cut up to an inch, inch and a quarter long because the stuff breaks down so easy in the room and in the mixer wagon anyway. And if we do that, you just reduce the number of cuts in the plant to about 80% down is what you're reducing the number of cuts, which means that much less leachate running out from stuff that is wet. And then using a homolactic bacteria, because this stuff is real high in sugar. You use a Buchneri type, you're going to have a god-awful mess. You use a homolactic type, it can move through real fast. And just to give you an idea of the range that we've done on this, um, uh, we were using some of the, the uh, concept uh, that you were talking about of boot stage stuff. We harvested boot stage. Uh, BMR sorghum, the 83, whatever, I don't remember the number on anyway. The guy had to get it off the field. So he mowed it off at boot stage, he used a homolactic bacteria, he cut it long, he put it into a bunk silo, packed it well, covered it well, 24 hours it was cold. And when he fed it to his cows, he took out 30% corn silage, put this in, maintained milk production, body condition score, and uh, components in the milk. So we know it can be done under those extreme conditions. I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember that right offhand. I'm, I'm wondering, did it go through a full fermentation? Oh, uh, yeah, it was fermented. Yeah, there was lactic and acetic numbers. I remember were good because uh, we did that once before on a grass-fed be uh, beef study, and we put up stuff that was 74% uh, no, moisture somewhere in there, and the numbers were perfect. And I called Lyman Kung up and says, what's this? Why are they perfect? And it was because we had such high sugar is that's why it worked. All right, we better reverse. I better get going again. I better get my talk done before I do my talk. Tell us who you are and take it away. Okay, and this is the clicker here. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm Tom Kelser. I'm a retired extension agent. Uh, I retired. What I did is I got rid of all the junky parts of my job. I kept all the fun parts. And so now I'm just having fun uh, doing research, uh, new crops, uh, new methods. Um, and we're moving ahead on a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, this is a piece that I have been interested in in a while. I did a lot of work uh, uh, with a predecessor for Alta Seeds um, back in the 90s using sorghum sedans. Uh, and then while we were waiting for the one cut to come out, uh, we were looking at a lot more pieces. We are strong proponents of very high forage diets and dairy cows. I work primarily with dairy cows. Uh, we have herds in our area that are 80-80, 80% forage, over 80 pounds of milk. We got a pile of herds that are over 70% forage. Uh, but to do that, we need really good quality feed and a lot of it. So when we're looking at feeding cows and one of the best things that helped me out is for a number of years I did rations. I'm an agronomist but I was doing rations. That taught me how to be a good agronomist. Until then I was not a good agronomist. But we're looking at growing energy, protein, digestible fiber in uh, sufficient amounts and low cost. That's the criteria that we need if we're going to get high production, high profitability. And we feel that the, these sorghum species uh, can meet that criteria. A, there are people who do not want to use a genetically modified crop. That's fine if that's their choice. But this one is not. Uh, it has the high BM digestibility, which is critical. Uh, we're getting yields, consistent yields, under a range of conditions. We have a little wider harvest window. Because of this ability to take some of these boot stage harvests, we're not waiting for a certain piece on the ear and then all of a sudden have it go by on us. Uh, in our area, uh, I don't know how it was down here, but last season, this past season, uh, the BMR corns got trashed big time with leaf diseases. Really trashed. Yields were down, uh, stock breakage was up, etc. Uh, you can drill it so you don't need a corn planter if you're not a farm that has a corn planter. Uh, and now there are shorter season varieties. And you're going to see in a minute why that is going to be real critical for us. 
Now, one of the pieces we developed, uh, actually I developed, uh, is a whole concept that we don't grow cover crops anymore, we grow winter forages. And that has been a real game changer all across the Northeast. Longest day of the year is June 21st. So uh, in there, we can grow a summer energy crop. Well, what we figured out was even in our northern areas, we put another crop on either end, in this case, winter triticale, and we're pulling off two crops on one acre. And that has really raised uh, the amount of feed uh, that we are producing. Uh, here it is um, in this one, let me back up here. Um, getting ahead of myself because I switched these slides about four times now. Uh, but where's the, which this one here is? Yeah, there's my arrow. All right. I'm going to start Upper Canada and move south, which is, you know, what are we doing way up there? Well, we got farmers up there. I had some that flew down from Alberta just to see what we're doing. They have a real short season. Uh, they got uh, uh, nine months of snow and froze and three months of rough sledding, as, as they say. Uh, they get cold real quick. They have a short season. But they do have a point where they can grow in the fall and the spring the winter forages, which means now they're crunched here in the middle. They used to, and they still use, very short season corns for silage. They're flint. Most of them are flint-type endosperm, which is not what we want, and you'll see why uh, in a minute. So uh, we're looking at using sorghum sedans, planting them in either seven and a half inch rows or 15 inch rows. Why? We got a short season, but we have long days. As one of the farmers said, he came back from spreading manure one night. I don't remember, he said it was 1030 or 1130 at night. And he never bothered putting the lights on in the tractor because he didn't need it. It was still light out. That's how far up these guys are. Uh, but we're putting in uh, these crops into here, and as long as we don't get a cool summer, they can grow in this short season. As long as we don't need a mature ear, we can use these core crops and get a BMR product to feed their cows in addition to having a winter forage in there. Moving down into my area, New York, lower New England, uh, southern Ontario, um, that was our longest day of the year. This is typically when the winter forages come off. Uh, and here's where the temper, typically where they go on. Um, put those two pieces together. We needed to have something in there that was not less than 90 days. But I wanted a BMR product because BMR is more digestible. But we don't have BMR corns that are less than 90 days that I know of. I had just talked to the guys the other day, and they said, no, we don't have that yet. In addition to that, a lot of the BMRs have harder kernels in them. Well, so you have to leave them sit in the silo until March until the kernels soften enough. All pieces that we don't want to deal with. Uh, we grow winter forage on either end of that. When you look at this as a package, this is a thing that has been the eye-opener for our farmers. Here is our summer forage. Here is our winter forage. This is growing on ground that would be 22, 23, maybe 24 tons to the acre of corn silage with a full season corn silage. We back it down to a 90 day or less than 90 day. Uh, this past year we were averaging 20.5 tons to the acre of 35% dry matter uh, sorghum off of this and we pulled off 10 tons of winter forage. Actually, some of my plots were 12, but I'm backing it down. 10 tons of winter forage. You put the two of them together, now we're running over 30 tons coming off of that ground that we didn't have there before. And the big piece that we are interested in, we have two chances of getting the crop. We're spreading our risk, because one of the things you're gonna have to deal with, Al Gore to the contrary, God is still running the earth, and the Pacific Ocean has just gone from a warm phase to a cool phase. The Atlantic Ocean has gone from a cool phase to a warm phase. That's why Hurricane Sandy got so big when it came up the coast. And that is going to go for the next 15 to 25 years. We just got done with the past 15 to 25 years. We're going to have weather that's more like the 1930s than we are the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. No, I wasn't around back then. I may look it, but well, I wasn't around then. Uh, but that's what the weather is going to be. We're going to have more variability, and we need to be able to consistently produce forage. And by getting two crops instead of one, our risk is now spread out. Uh, the other thing that they found out is this. The winter forage is awesome, awesome 
milk feed. It's for the best cows you have out there, the peak producers. And then we team that up with a BMR corn. We can easily go over 70% forage in the diet uh, on dairy rations. So some of the issues we've had with the traditional crops, as I said, uh, no BMR corn, less than 90 days. But this big one here is this shorter season corn is out of the flint type endosperms. I was talking to a guy who was trying to breed some of these for us, uh, and he says it's been a real challenge because of this rock hard corn. When you take a manure that's come out the back of a cow, in this case it was a kernel processed uh, crop, and I will not say what the name of the company is, though they have yelled at me for about an hour and a half one day. Uh, here's the second screen down. Broken up corn, that was kernel processed, and that went all the way through the cow and came out the other end. What is the energy that the cow is getting as opposed to what Ralph just figured out the forage analysis said was in that feed? You gotta put a big deduct in there because the cow never got it and went out the other end. Well, some of the guys crank down on their processors. We can process it so, instead of having that, they have yellow sand. And when you get real up close and personal with it and put it between your fingers and rub it, you got hard yellow sand, which is ground up flint type of corn or hard kernel corn that is not digesting. It doesn't show us kernels in the manure, but it went all the way through the cow and was never used. So this is a piece that we are very concerned about. When you go to the, the BMR sorghum species, we're not looking at a whole lot of grain production. Why? Because when you put grain into the cow, first of all, you have the problems I just showed. Secondly, you have your energy is in this bomb. It's like throwing a hand grenade in, and if it breaks down quick, that energy is dumping real quick into the cow. Here, the energy is more stored in the forage, and the forage is like each cell is like one of these tables. And first, the bacteria break into this cell, release the energy and the protein, then they break into that cell, release the energy and protein, and so on. And by having this steady release of energy and protein, we're not getting the acidosis, we're maintaining the high pH in the rumens, which is maintaining components, maintaining uh, papillae, uh, and maintaining the forage digesters in the cows. So in a high forage diet, we like BMR, uh, and in this case, we don't want to have a lot of grain in there for it. We still use grain to balance out the ration. We still use corn silage, but this is one of the reasons we're looking at the sorghum species. Uh, that was an 83-day that can fit in our rotation on a 15-inch. This is a 90-day. I planted it on 7.5-inch because I wanted to get it to fill in. Uh, I will say right up front, we ran into problems with establishing a population. Uh, this was really, I thought, crappy stands in terms of establishment, uh, but they tillered so much, by the time we got done, there was no statistical difference uh, between the different uh, ones uh, in terms of our final yield. No difference whatsoever. So it, this, this is a brachytic dwarf, uh, really filled in uh, tremendously for us. And we're using a drill. In this case, I had an old 1960s drill. If anybody runs into this, we had an old drill. Did a crappy job. I was struggling with it, struggling with it. A friend of mine had a brand new uh, Great Plains drill. I borrowed that day-night difference in the stands established. I could gear it down to what I need. I could set it up the way I wanted. It. it had gauges on the press wheels, et cetera. It did an exacting job, and we got exacting stands then because of it. This is where the direction things are going. This is a brachytic dwarf. That's the 90-day. This is the 83-day non-brachytic dwarf. Uh, I did run a second year in a row. I did a nitrogen uh, study with this. And uh, when Chris was working <laughs> with you guys, I called Chris up and I says, we can't do this. It's outlawed under the Geneva Convention. To have me go into this mess and try to figure out where the plots are as it's all laying down from 11 feet tall, it's now this high, crisscrosswise, it was a god-awful mess to harvest. And no farmer will put up with it. But right next to it, these suckers stood like rocks. You could get hurt running into them. Because of this thicker stalk, even though it's BMR, it has standability. And when you look at it, there's the 83 day one in the back. Here is the 90, here is the uh, 110, and this, I think, was the 95. And you can see they're shorter, but it ended up getting the same yield. The analogy I use, it's like, you know, these basketball players, they're what, seven feet tall? 
but you put a football linebacker that's a whole lot shorter than they are alongside them, the football linebacker will outweigh the basketball player. And that's what we have here. We've got the basketball players here, and these are the football linebackers, and the weight is there. Uh, once I get down to having more uniform stands, I think we're going to be even beating it in terms of yields. So as we move further south, we run into different sets of conditions. Uh, you get down into Pennsylvania, Ohio region, uh, they can get some hot and dry out here. Not as often, but they do get some times where it gets really hot and dry. And so what we're looking at doing is two advantages they have. First of all, they can grow a longer summer annual. So now we have these 90, 95, and 100 day varieties can fit right in. They're already available. And our winter forage now, instead of getting uh, 10 tons to the acre, they're getting consistently 12 to 15 tons to the acre. Add that to 20, 22, 24 tons of uh, sorghum silage, now you have kick butt yields. And the soil is not washing away because we got a better cover crop out there than any guy who ever planted cover crops. We don't grow cover crops, we grow winter forages. And we have a crop in here that we're planting on narrow rows which is also protecting the soil and has a fibrous root system. So all the way through this cycle, we are building soil structure, we're reducing soil erosion, and under the CAFO things, we are tying up nutrients all the way in there. Now, uh, they talked about it this morning, uh, the moisture, the water, uh, and this is what we have seen. Uh, in Texas, they were saying corn, one inch of water gives eight tenths of a ton uh, of corn silage. Uh, with sorghum, one inch gives almost double that. Uh, these are my plots at the research farm. We had a screaming dry, this was sorghum sedan, we had screaming dry weather in the mid-90s, so yeah, we get droughts too about every five years. <laughs> we, we alternate back and forth. We don't have them at the same time as you guys do. Uh, but here is our corn silage. That's 5.75 tons to the acre of 35% dry matter material. That's the economics on that. Right next to it, we were getting almost 12 tons from the sorghum uh, sedans. And that's before we knew how to really grow them. So when it turns dry, this stuff is going to just walk right around it and give you that consistent yield. We still grow corn, but we're also growing sorghum sedans. Again, with this, uh, this uh, radical weather, we need to spread our risks. You don't put all your eggs in one basket of any kind. And then as we move further south down into Virginia, uh, you start getting uh, hotter and drier uh, than we are. Uh, you can grow a longer summer annual. So you can put in some of these 110, 105 day dwarf, burkitic dwarf sorghums, uh, uh, the BMR sorghums, and they will come right through the dry spell. You get a, a, a gap in here that's, that the stuff stops growing for a while, and then it will start growing again. Add to that, in addition to a longer season that's going to yield more, you put a winter forage on it. You get down here, the winter forages don't shut down. They keep on growing right through the winter. They're tillering a whole lot more, and you can get some incredible yields out of this stuff, in addition then to your summer crop, and you never leave that soil bare. And one of the pieces we're looking at, I was appreciated when you were saying that some of the soils you put it on were not the best. Well, one of the things we're looking at here is that's when the ground is driest, right? So we're deep tilling, shattering the compacted layers out, putting a winter forage on. That root system is going all the way down through. We take it off and come right back in with another crop that has root systems that go all the way down through. And instead of growing the crop on this much, we're growing the crop on this much with a whole lot more organic matter. So you just increase the yield potential and completely eliminated uh, soil erosion using these two crops together. It's sort of like a left and right hand glove. They really fit. Uh, and then when you get down to the real southern regions, uh, you can grow the full season sorghums, as I said, uh, or the other possibility is uh, your summer annual, you put in a shorter season corn in here. Grow a short season one, get it off, come back in with your sorghum species when your hot and drier weather is starting to hit. So now you're targeting your crop for the conditions that you're going to be growing under. And we still have our winter forage growing right through the winter. 
All right, now there's another piece in here that, uh, where's my water? How's my time? Mm -hmm. We have another piece in here that has us very, very excited, and that is developing a crop system and an energy system for organic farms. They need a high forage diet. They can't afford to buy the grain that they have. The nice milk price they get takes the legs right out from under them when they start buying a lot of grain. They need to be well over 60%, and I feel they should be at 70% or more forage in the diet if you want to stay in business in an organic dairy. It's critical to profit. But the nice pieces about this is, okay, it's not a GMO crop, so you can use it. It's not susceptible to most of the corn insects and diseases we have. One of the little things we're looking at, you know, they're stacking up all these genes to try to get the rootworms under control. We got a simple answer for that. You grow corn this year, you grow sorghum the next year, you can come back with any corn the following year because any rootworm that grows, when the plants are real little, that's when the prussic acid is highest in the plant. And they come crawling along and they take a bite out of the roots, they get a snook full of prussic acid or cyanide and they're toast. You just wiped out the rootworm uh, population and so for the next two years, you don't have to worry about getting things that are stacked to the ceiling in order for it to grow because you just eliminated the insects utilizing this in one part of the rotation. Uh, the other piece is, is planting with a drill. You're going to have less weed pressure. This is some earlier work I had done, uh, sorghum sedans. Uh, I think we got hail, that's why it looks a little bit ratty. Uh, 100 pounds of the acre and 40 pounds of the acre. And you look at all these gaps in here, and what happens in those gaps? Weeds come in. So a uh, big discussion I had with Dr. Undersander, who I, I very much respect, he was saying, we don't need this high seeding rate. I didn't see any yield increase as I raised the seeding rate. Well, you know what? In my data, I found the same thing. I saw no yield increase with increasing the seeding rate, but what I did see was a big decrease in the amount of weeds that made up that seeding rate. So by going to a little higher population, all right, we didn't buy any herbicides, guys got to sell you a little more seed, but by getting it in there and getting it in rows narrow, we get to cover the ground sooner. You don't have the weed pressure, and that's where organic farms can tap this because they're out there beating the snot out of their soil. They really care about the soil, soil structure, soil organic matter, and then they beat it to a powder with cultivators because they have to grow corn because that's what real farmers do. Well, I think there's other choices out there that can fit the organic farms. Uh, this is a farm that uh, planted um, a sorghum sedan, and he missed the spot right here. There is no velvet leaf in the rest of the field. Matter of fact, there were no weeds in the rest of the field, but all of them were right here where the crop was not growing. So you get it in warm ground, and you plant it in narrow rows, and you plant it with enough population. It shades the ground quick enough. These weeds can't stand up to it. And that is a huge issue on organic farms, is to keep the weeds under control. Uh, here is sorghum sedan on seven and a half inches. And you look underneath here, nothing can grow. This has not been in the ground very long. It was up about this high. Uh, nothing can grow underneath that stuff because it's shading the ground very quickly because it was planted when it was warm. The other thing that we like, because a lot of the organic farms are smaller, we have flexibility in both harvest because we can harvest it boot stage. We can harvest it at more mature grain. Uh, sorghum sedans you can cut multiple times or one time, as I was talking about. Uh, it depends on what your needs are, and it's not dependent on grain fill. Uh, here is a farm that was using it in rotational grazing. Uh, most of the farm, or a lot of the farms, uh, we don't grow a lot of ryegrass up our way. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of it because ryegrass is a major problem in the southern states in terms of as a weed. So, uh, and ours tends to head out really quick. So, there's probably seed guys will argue with me on it, but I don't like it very much. But we do need an energy source because we're having grasses, cool season grasses, producing 25, 28 percent protein. We don't have energy to match that up, so that's not being utilized real well. But if we turn them out for part of the day onto this, uh, this happens to be sorghum sedan, 
uh, and graze in. Now we're putting in real high energy, high sugar, and you take that protein from the cool seasons and put it in with it. Now you have a complete TMR that's meeting the cow's uh, needs. Some other more practical pieces we have run into. Uh, this was on either side of the road. Uh, this guy was bound and determined to get his corn in. This is all lake laid clay soils. So they're tough to work with. Tough to get it in. He went and planted his corn anyway. It's tasseling. It's this high. You know, what kind of economics is there? Across the road, we were able to wait because, and now what we would do now is we would have a winter forage on there. On these heavy clay soils, we grow a winter forage. There's 60% less available water in the spring under these things. So our wet soils are now dried out in the spring. So you can get the crop off, turn around, and you put your uh, sorghum or sorghum sedan in here. And we put it in later, so we're not mudding it in. So now that crop is coming up good. If it goes wet again on us, we can come back and fix it. You can't fix corn once it's up to a certain height. But we can mow this off and come back in and fix it with some nitrogen and sulfur and be back in business again. You get to fix things as you go through the season, which is important with our very variable weather that we have. Now, there's a piece, though, that I want to bring up that you need to know about. And there is a huge discussion going on about this right now. Is it a discussion or is it an argument? Um, some people are saying there's no things as such as allelopathy, it's only nitrogen uh, deficiency. Uh, I have, uh, you'll see in some of these pictures, I beg to differ with some of that. Uh, this was a winter grain taken off uh, the 18th of May. This picture was taken uh, the 7th of July. Any herbicide put on that field was put across the entire field. Why it didn't grow right here? Because that's allelopathy. Here is in between the plots. There's a few weeds starting to come in, a few coming in here. A month later, whereas in between where the alleyways were, weeds are coming up the wazoo. That's allelopathy in action. And what I worry about with small seeded crops like teff and like the sorghum species is coming up with this. This was planted on one side on bare soil, I came back up the other side into winter grain. That's what I had. They were planted within minutes of each other. That difference in growth is an allelopathic effect. And there's a, a, a Brown in 2005 had a nice paper on this. Uh, this is out in Utah. Uh, fallow versus uh, triticale. Rye is worse than triticale. Winter wheat or winter barley. All the winter grains reduce vigor of corn plants following these crops. They are worse on teff and sorghum, sorghum sedans. I didn't put the picture in, but I had one picture where it just didn't grow. We're trying to figure this out. We do know working the soil a little bit may get around that. Uh, we have had anecdotal information that plastering it with liquid manure gets around it. Uh, when I, do, I did one study with that, and to do that, I had to take five-gallon pails and load them onto my trailer and bring it out to where I was going and then hand spread it and my wife wouldn't let me in the house until I got dressed in the backyard because I smelled so bad. Uh, unfortunately that's all we've got for equipment so that's what we do. Um, I did not see any allelopathic plus or minus nitrogen on corn. But corn is a bigger seed so I want to repeat it again using the sorghum species this year to see if that if I can get around it with liquid manure. The other is if you have a wavy coulter in the front and you work a little narrow zone that gets around it. If you spread manure and you incorporate it that's going to get around it. There's a whole bunch of steps that we can get around but we're trying to figure it out. There's environmental benefits too. Uh, I think the organic people are on to this more than some of the conventional ones. First of all, you've got half the soil erosion uh, that you do of conventional corn. Here's corn. Uh, this is probably a month uh, or more after planting, probably more like more. And here is three weeks after planting sorghum sedans or sorghums with a drill, except for the brachytic dwarfs. So it's take a whole lot longer. This stuff is up out of the ground, shading the ground keeping weeds from growing, protecting the soil so it's not washing away. So that was a quick rundown of what we've done. Yes? I was wondering, one, one of the, you know, when you have this lunar angel, summer angel system, I think one of the challenges to be is you get a dry, a dry spring. Because that, that small grain crop, 
It's still going to pump the water out. Yep. Exactly. And then you have a real, I've seen failures of Corey Corbin. Mm -hmm. Corbin's unanimous, just because of his unanimous decision. Mm -hmm. Bill Walker, yeah. Bill Walker, Bill Walker. Yeah, you might have to just wait until it rains then to put it in the ground. Yeah. But yes, you're absolutely right. It can pump out enough water. But usually in the spring with snow melt and everything else, we're okay. Last spring, what? Not in Virginia. Yes, you don't have snow. I'm sorry, I forgot uh, where I am. Uh, last year, um, we had screaming dry conditions from the middle of April through until the winter forage came off. And the day after the winter forage came off, it started raining. The following week, we got three feet of snow, uh, and then it rained for the next month. So it's just, you know, where is it going to hit? But you're absolutely right. It can over pump the water out. And we do appreciate you coming to the last talk. <laughs> prussic acid, yes. I mentioned it a little bit in there. Uh, prussic acid is highest when the plant just comes out of the ground. As it gets bigger, the prussic acid goes down. And I think that's why in our area, until the Canadian red wolf moved in and decimated the herds, um, we used to have a deer problem. The deer would hide in the sorghum and come out and eat the corn. Uh, so I'm thinking that could be part of what it is. Uh, the other piece, though, is uh, we were looking at doing some work on this, and I wanted to take samples, and I talked to some guys, I think it was in Kansas, who would do the analysis. And he says, if you drop a sample between the field and the lab, he says, go back and get another sample. It dissipates that fast. It goes off as a gas. It breaks down very quickly. If you're ensiling it, you do not worry about it. Where you're worrying about it is if you're grazing it and you get a frost, uh, that's where you could run into issues. I talked with some guys who had been around for a long time, three different people who had been involved with this over the years, and I'm talking you know, back into the 60s, uh, 19, not 18, uh, and they said they didn't know of one case of prussic acid poisoning. But every year, they were dead cows from nitrates. So we haven't seen the prussic acid, but we have seen dead cows from nitrates because we had dry weather, they put too much nitrogen on, then it rained and they immediately harvested. But a lot, a lot, a lot of same thing. It sets up yourself for a real issue, and that's where a forage sample can get around it. But they have never seen any samples that would say this was from prussic acid because it volatilizes so easy when you chop it up. You go and green chop a load of this and leave it on the wagon overnight and feed it to the cows the next morning. Uh, well, you'd probably been easier if you just sold the cows because you at least have live cows and they would be all dead. So you can do it, but there is more nervousness over that, which is maybe in a way is good because it gets them to be aware because if you know what you're doing, then you're less likely to have a problem. So uh, yes, that is a potential problem, but at the same time, it's a benefit because you just cleaned out all the rootworms uh, in your field. They go and take a bite out of it. They don't do well with cyanide either, and they're toast. So you can put that uh, to your favor. Let's see if I left the picture in there. I deleted some of them. Here. <coughs> we came right in uh, after he took the uh, last cutting of sorghum off, uh, beginning of September, no-tilled his triticale right into it. Uh, this is after a couple of frosts, and you can see the triticale is doing fine, thank you. And do I have the next picture? No, I don't have the next picture. The next picture showed uh, this whole area right through here, this wide, all the way up and back around is after the hurricane came in, that's where the water was flowing and had zero erosion. He actually gained some soil between the triticale and the dead uh, sorghum sedan residue. Don't worry about it. Just go right on in with your no-till planter and plant right into it. Any growth is just going to simply help to hold the soil, provide organic matter. So we don't worry about burning it down. I don't want to spend money if I don't have to. Is what a person was going to do a pasture or a hay field behind that, you know, where they're planting middle of August, end of August, mm -hmm. you would have slaughter, correct? Uh, depends on where you're located. Where I am, not much, if anything. Down here, yes. 
I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't be grazing it that fall because you could run into the prussic acid issue, but uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Now, what happens when it's short like this, a killing frost gets down into it real quick. Uh, I have seen 23 degrees, the corn was dead, the sorghum was still alive, except for the top foot and a half. It was such a thick stand, I mean, it's up over my head. It only got this far down, the cold, and the rest of it was all green, which, you know, you're not going to graze that. You want to chop it and burn off the process. Yes? Yes. No. <coughs> the number one problem we have on northeast, at least in my area, dairy farms, is where are we going to go with all this manure? And what we found is we can come in in the fall and put manure on before we plant the triticale. Matter of fact, I just got a research grant uh, January 1st <laughs> uh, to look at nitrogen in the fall and then nitrogen in the spring. I did a quickie one last year. We found we picked up 60 pounds of nitrogen in the fall. I have some plots in right now that I planted the end of August, so they had a longer growing season, and we think we picked up 145 pounds of nitrogen in the living tissue going into this winter. And we're going to see how much of that is there the next spring. So what it's done is opened up a door for us. We're under CAFO regs. We can put manure down and plant this crop right afterwards. And it's storing the nitrogen, pre-priming the winter forage uh, with nitrogen for the following spring. <coughs> Phosphorus, potassium, everything else, yeah. <coughs> yes, we are, <coughs> excuse me, we are hauling a tremendous amount of nutrients off. But like you were saying, you had some farms doing it on very small acreage. Well, if we're hauling it off, it's coming in on a high forage diet. It's coming back out the back of the cow, and we need to move that back out onto the fields. And we're getting more windows here to put that back onto the field. So we're rolling it over. The biggest thing we've been able to do to reduce our mass nutrient balance, because we're getting excess phosphorus, A, incorporate the manure immediately, and B, go to a 70% forage diet. Does wonders for fixing that whole situation. Uh, it depends on uh, the, are you incorporating immediately? And I tell guys incorporate immediately. Uh, we're looking, we're targeting at this point my guess, and it's only a guess because I haven't got the data done yet. I'm in the, just getting into this research thing. Uh, is our guess is about 60 pounds of nitrogen for New York conditions if we're planning the 10th of September. If we're planning the 20th of September, we're thinking it might be 40 pounds. If you're planning the 1st of October in New York, don't bother because it's not going to do you any good. It might help P and K, but that's all. My question to these guys are the implications. Are doing what? How much manure per acre are these guys putting down if they're doing the sorghum? Let's say the cow rotation. They put 15,000 an acre, 20. Like you're saying, those guys yeah. are going to fall. Okay. The fall crop, we're looking at putting on about uh, five to maybe 7,000 gallons. That goes on in the fall. We haven't figured out how to put it on in the spring to feed the uh, triticale because work that I did and work they did up in Ontario found it's not a very efficient way of putting nitrogen on. So we take that crop off and then you're going to be growing sorghum. How much nitrogen do we need, because uh, he just ducked out, how much nitrogen do we need to grow a full sorghum crop? My, I just got some plot analysis back literally before I came here and we're looking at about 100 120, maybe 130 pounds of nitrogen. So how much manure do you have to put on and incorporate right away to get that amount? That's the, that's the number. Okay, so my mark, I guess, if you put on 6,000 in the fall and 8 or 10,000 in the spring, you know what it's all about? I mean, you may not have enough P and K. You're trying to bring in. I, mean, I don't know. So you're trying to remove draw, and then what do you do with that extra food yeah. that you didn't need? Well, that's so why we're... Kind of, kind of mm -hmm. You've got to eliminate your whole thing. Mm -hmm. You've got Yeah.
that's, uh, it, that's, a, that's a real issue that we're running into. This uses a lot more than just corn does. Uh, what they do, a lot of guys do on the corn is they, they waste it, they put it out there, they don't incorporate it. That raises the P and K, reduces the nitrogen. I think that's a waste of money. So we're coming in and incorporating it right away. We may be able to go higher because that 60 pounds I have so far was just one study and our yields were lower than normal because of the spring drought. Where we're getting four and a quarter tons to the acre, there, we think it may be even higher. It may be closer to 80 in the fall. And we're also looking at some of these uh, in sod injection manure units as a way of being able to put it onto the winter grain in the spring so we can make use of the manure there again. And each time you're putting P and K in, but at a ratio that's closer to what the plant is than the, the daily spread type of thing. And critical, critical on both of these crops, you're adding sulfur. And in our area, we're really sulfur short now because they cleaned up the air. And so we need sulfur, and manure is one of the best places to get it from. You can't ask questions. You're not. <laughs> uh, whatever you do, don't chisel plow. I had a guy do that. And he made this field of basketball-sized lumps. And then he had to take his disc and just pound the snot out of it to make it into something again. A uh, couple of pieces. One, uh, any tillage will get rid of that. We're using, looking at things like double-ganged airways at a shallow angle to work it up. Uh, we have anecdotal evidence that liquid manure will do it. Uh, any tillage will do it. Wavy coulters I'm going to test this year. Can we run a wavy coulter in front of the no-till planter and just work up a little narrow zone around the seed because we can put these small sorghum seeds in here as long as we work up a little zone. We may be fine. I don't know the answer to it. So it's something we're, we don't, we're still trying to figure out. Yeah. yeah, and actually that ends up being practically what people do because uh, in my area, the triticale comes off around the 15th to 18th of May, and they keep going right on through doing their haylage because that's what they need to. That's the most important step at that time of the year. They keep mowing haylage, and they ignore those fields. And when they get their haylage done, well, now we're getting to the 1st of June. The ground is warmer. We've just had a couple weeks of uh, breakdown. We have rain and everything else moving through it. We put some manure on it, minimum work it in, and go ahead and plant. We probably would not have a problem. But most cases, we do not have a problem. But I have case, seen cases where there has been. And so I'm trying to tell you the whole picture so that you're at least aware of it ahead of time. I don't want you to walk into it and get blindsided. Any other questions? If you are interested, um, let me see if I have my, uh, if I can move back. Um, you gotta remember all this as fast as I show it there. If you go to my website right here, um, www.advancedagsys.com or I get my business card. I have some up here with me. Uh, I do have a newsletter I send out each month. And it, what it is is nothing but uh, my research that I write up and I tell you what we found out. No, I did not. No, I did not. Uh, that's something that uh, we can, you can come into winter forages and plant soybeans into it, no problem at all. Uh, my next newsletter that I'm writing uh, is going to be on where we come in with a conventional drill with press wheels, not a, broad, not a roller, doesn't work, broadcasting and rolling doesn't work, but we come in with a conventional drill, a 1960s drill with press wheels. We cut a little groove into the soil, into the stubble, drop an alfalfa seed, cover it up, and I am getting better stands than where I plow and disc and plant in April. Better stands, less weeds, if any weeds. What it, 
The drill? Uh, this would be after the triticale comes off, which is somewhere between uh, middle of May and the 10th of June. It's not supposed to, yeah, it's not supposed to work then, and it works. I didn't talk about it the first time I did it. It scared me it worked so well. One of the guys looked at it at the end of the year, and he said, it looks like a two-year-old stand. And that went through the 2012 drought, and it went through potato leaf hoppers that were so bad, the other alfalfa looked like these walls, because we get wicked leaf hoppers in my area. And this stuff came through just incredible. So I said, I can't tell anybody. It's obviously as soon as I tell them, uh, something's going to come up and screw it up. So I tried it again this year, and it worked the second year in a row. So I'm going to put the kiss of death on it. I'm going to write it up in my newsletter and tell people about it. So that should really screw it up. <laughs> that's the way things go, right? <laughs> anybody who does research knows that's the way that works. <laughs> but it has worked very, very well. We didn't try any grasses. It may be in a lilopathy. I don't know, but we're also waiting a week or so. So try it. I have no idea. I don't. Uh, we're going 18 somewhere's in there. But it's a slick time. You're not out there, you know, early in the spring trying to do it with the mud and everything. Oh, hey, just sit back, take it easy, let your stuff come up, put some nitrogen on, harvest off 12 tons of primo primo forage, come back and put your alfalfa seeding in behind it. How many people get 12 tons of primo forage? off of an alfalfa seeding year. So all of a sudden, it's got some real promise. And then for the organic people, all right, we don't put herbicide on, but we can still use the same principle, just go in there and plant it. But like I said, it was scary. It worked so well. Oh, he's got the stick out. You see, he just got the stick out there. <laughs> 